Hey guys, welcome to The Secret History, living in your rice fish. Wait, well, it seems like that's what it is lately. So let's talk about these red cap rice fish. They are really beautiful. I'm keeping them in pretty warm water for rice fish. They can withstand very cool water. And what's this? We have a female. And what is that on her belly? Well, that is a whole lot of eggs. She actually just rubbed one off. Uh, I said rubbed one off of the eggs. I didn't say out. And uh, she is swimming around dropping those eggs. Now, the interesting thing about these Madaka rice fish, these Japanese rice fish, is that in the wild, they're kind of more of a clear fish, and we have selectively bred them, we being humans, specifically the humans who do, did it being Japanese. And uh, we have bred them so that they could be viewed from above. So they really stand out when they're in little pots on your patio or in ponds or um, flower vases, fish bowls, more traditional fish bowls, I should say. And so they're a very pretty fish. Uh, and this red cap strain has this lovely little orange uh, color to its head, which it's kind of hard to see on some of them. But others, it, it stands out very plainly. Um, it's just not always the best on video. Uh, the, the color is kind of an iridescent color. But what I wanted to show you is one of the coolest evolutionary adaptations. adaptations. Check that out. So the females and males, they'll mate a few days early. And instead of spawning like salmon or, you know, tradition, like a lot of fish do traditionally, which is uh, the eggs are laid and then the male comes by and has to fertilize them. These guys have a little more of a uh, well thought out, <laughs> well planned out a plan of, of attack. And that is they actually make sure that they get fertilized internally. So they're like live bearers in that sense. But then they carry this cluster of eggs after, so the egg, the eggs are, uh, are these little teeny cells living inside of the fish's ovaries, and they release a, a set amount of them. They then grow, and they have a yolk, basically, a proto-yolk. It's, it's an early form of a yolk. And then what happens is that grows and matures in their bellies, and then the males... See, here's one with uh, a big belly, probably full of eggs that she's going to have tomorrow or the next two or three days. And then the males, which are more long and slender, uh, a lot more aerodynamic looking, and they have more of a specialized little fin that's similar to a gonopodium, which is the little uh, fin on guppies where they, they use that fin. It's a specialized fin that tucks a packet of the the fertilization uh, material, which is also a, a sticky gel. And then that is what the female guppies actually, uh, on guppies, they, they, they will internalize that, save it, and they can choose to use that later or right then and there, which is interesting. They can save that their whole life almost, two or three years at least. And these rice fish, however, they have to use the genetic material uh, that they get, and uh, they, they have three or four days to decide if they're going to use it or, or expel it. But as long as they were impressed by the little mating dance that occurred, usually in the early morning, but today is uh, midday, actually, almost mid-afternoon, uh, then they will swim around with these eggs, sometimes five, six hours, sometimes just a couple hours, where did the one with the eggs go? Um, and they will swim around and they'll find a, a, a quiet spot to hide them. And they'll just stick them to something. And then they'll swim off. And it's for the egg's own good that they swim off. Uh, and that kind of makes them an egg scatterer. But they also kind of stay together in a little packet. Now these red caps seem to be a line that has a lot of eggs. Uh, they all seem to be carrying when they when they are showing that they have them instead of one or two every every uh, day I'm seeing more like 15 in one day uh, and that happens maybe once a week or something like that uh, 
it's hard to know which ones are which, except for the ones with really strong markings. So it's a little bit of a guessing game on knowing just exactly how frequently that they have them. But here we are again. There is the one with the eggs, and she's got a really nice orange cap back there on her head. So I will. what I will do is I will catch her in a net, and then I'm going to set aside the eggs with all these other eggs for a week to two weeks. They're a little warmer, so they should hatch a little sooner, but I'm going to set them aside, and then uh, once we see fry swimming, uh, they'll go ahead and hatch, and then we'll have the hatchlings uh, probably go into one of the little fish bowls over there or uh, into one of the shrimp tanks downstairs, let them grow out, eat little uh, plankton or you know, any little uh, nematodes and micro crustaceans that are in the tank. And they grow extremely fast because within two and a half to three months, they are ready to reproduce, the babies are. Even if they're that small, uh, they'll still be much smaller than these ones. These are full grown, probably a year old or six months old. Uh, but they don't live terribly long and they have uh, the ability to reproduce quickly because they are a form of keelyfish or that's the Dutch word for ditch or um, dugout trench irrigation. And so it, it means quite literally like fish living in a puddle, living in a ditch. Um, and that's where a, the, a lot of the pseudomagills and blue-eyed signifers, uh, these are basically the most northern range of that type of killifish. We think of those as rainbow fish, but really they're all kind of the same in that they can withstand different salinity, their eggs can take a couple weeks to hatch, and they can also kind of suspend the lifespan of their eggs uh, just by uh, where they lay them. So if they lay them in mud or on moss or something like that, they won't hatch quite as readily and it may take like a big rainstorm and the TDS to drop and the temperature to drop for them to hatch, um, which is interesting. You can ship these eggs. They're a lot firmer and more hardy in many cases. So we're going to steal those eggs from that poor little gal if I can find her again. Uh, she will hide quite uh, quite seriously, <laughs> uh, I've noticed. That's how you can figure out which one has eggs which day in this group is who's uh, hiding down low most of the time. But usually the best way to catch these fish is to take a net and to put the net in the water. Well, duh. To take the net and put it deep in the water down below where all the action is and just let it sit there for a little bit. And then when they swim up over it around here, you can uh, bring that net up slowly in a slow transition and then catch them. Uh, the interesting thing is these ones don't need current. These fish definitely don't need currents at all. But they do really seem to be enjoying the current in this tank. They seem to all be lining up and taking turns kind of surfing the current. So go figure. Um, these these uh, eggs can hatch at pretty much any temperature that you'd be comfortable to live indoors at. Anywhere from 55 to... 80 degrees say and um, really they're uh, pretty easy to take care of when they hatch they're not the teeniest fry in the world they're they are small because you know they're fish that have recently hatched from eggs this size but they are uh, larger than like rainbow fish uh, you know fry or anything like that or any of the rasboras or tetras we've done definitely so uh you know, ironically, the pseudomagills are another one, and they're in here as well, the Luminatus pseudomagills, which right here uh, with the blue eyes. And they also, they for their size, they have one of the largest eggs in the fish world, uh, and they lay a couple eggs a day pretty much every day once they're full grown. So kind of interesting that they're kind of, I guess they're vaguely related to one another and that their ranges overlap somewhat. Uh, the families of fish. So after we get those fry going, you know, I'll update you guys and show you what's going on. But that's kind of uh, that's kind of that. There's the pregnant one back over there. You can even see the eggs from above here, and you can see she's been dropping some. You see, there's like a thread that runs through those eggs, and she can drop them off uh, on material, kind of one at a time, almost like a 
parachute jumpers on a jump line where one gets caught and it pulls the next one out and then the next one and the next one so she can kind of move it around but right now there's an egg hanging way low down below and she'll she'll detach that and i want to catch that egg because these fish in this tank are artful there we go we got her uh artful at catching their eggs from one another so here we have her in a net well we won't bug her and pull her out of the water but we're going to get the little uh We'll get a little uh, turkey baster, not a turkey baster, pipette, that's the right word, it's not a mini turkey baster, um, and then we'll we'll take that off, and we'll probably put it on some yarn here. If it sits on the bottom, even in this methylene blue, which deters uh, mold and rot fungi from forming, uh, they have a better chance of doing well. Uh, if they actually sit down uh, on the bottom, they gather with debris, and I've had to toss some eggs. So here's one that's turning white. If they turn white, that that means that they're probably no good. You're looking for a translucent egg, ideally. And here, like some of these eggs, you can actually see little dots. Like the one uh, right here, you can actually see a little black dot. And those are the eyes forming. And then you'll actually see the spinal column forming. And it's pretty cool to watch uh, all that unfold. So... Uh, the methylene blue is not great for the fish once they hatch, so you got to really kind of be watching a couple times a day. Go check out the the little container and uh, make sure that everything's looking the way it should. But after that, you can just take them out of there and uh, put them in a little gentle, small container. And they really don't need anything, these rice fish, uh, as far as, as fry. They really don't need anything other than some small food for the first few weeks. They'll live off their yolk sac for the first four to five days, and uh, you can even feed them like powdered flake food if you really have to in most cases. They've been pretty thoroughly domesticated over the years. So that's the story with these rice fish, and hopefully we will have some babies to show you soon, uh, and we can uh, show you what's going on. The same thing is going on outside except for Instead of gathering these eggs, uh, we will be just allowing them to colony breed outside. But you can see here, uh, she has a lot of eggs. She has at least one, two, three. I mean, there's at least six or seven showing on either side of her. So I'll go ahead and count them. She just dropped one, too. Uh, I'll go ahead and count them uh, and uh, let you know in the future uh, how many eggs, you know, I'm averaging, but this strain seems to be really good, and I want to thank Aquatic Arts again for hooking it up. You can find information on them and on some of these unusual rice fish strains that they're trying to make a more, uh, consistent, regular thing. You can learn more about them as well as all these plants. Most of them I've acquired through them, uh, at aquaticarts.com, and then it's in the link below. You can get a discount, on some of these beautiful plants and all sorts of food and other stuff. Right now they're sourcing a lot of stuff from other uh, hobbyists. So people like me who are now growing fish they've bought from them and basically selling them back for credit. So it's pretty cool that even though we don't have imports going on too much, uh, some of these uh, fish are maintaining a presence in the hobby just because of hobbyists. So. Start breeding your fish now and let me know if you guys have ever seen uh, the black or any of the golden black uh, Madaka lines. I would love to get my hands on some of those and I would love to hear from you in the comments uh, or any of the short body or long fin varieties. I'm just really transfixed by these guys this year, especially the, the, the opalescent pearl scaling on here with the creamsicle colors. They're just an awesome fish. All right, guys, that's what I have to say, and I've said it. Uh, good luck with your tubbing, your rice fishing, whether it's indoor at a tropical temperature. Yes, you can do it, even though they are kind of cold water fish. Um, but if you want them to live a longer life, keep them down below around 72 degrees or cooler and... Uh, you know, just don't heat the tanks. In the 60s is perfect. So, all right, guys, I will talk to you later. Have a wonderful day and swim on.